This, this conference will now be recorded. Welcome everyone. My name is Katie Reinhardt. I am the Special Collections Librarian at the Richardson Sloan Special Collections Center of the Davenport Public Library. Uh, we thank you for joining us tonight for our program on Milton Howard and family. I am honored to be speaking tonight with Karen Orozco Gutierrez of Davenport, Iowa, who has spent years diligently researching her family history, particularly her great-grandfather, Milton Howard. Howard had a remarkable life spanning the 19th and early 20th centuries. Karen will not only be telling us about the story of Milton Howard's life, but recounting her own amazing research journey. So let's begin at the beginning, Karen, of Milton Howard's life. Where was he born and under what circumstances? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Katie, for inviting me to this question and answer session. Uh, myself and my family always love opportunities to talk about our great, our uh, ancestor, Milton Howard, because we think he was really something special and we always have. So Milton Howard was born about 1851 in Muscatine County, Iowa, to a free mother. And we know that he we know this because because of the laws back then in the eight, at that time, the status of the child took the status of the mother. So he couldn't have been free unless his mother was free. So that's really how we know that he uh, was a free person. He did have a father and several siblings, but we don't really know their status. We have some ideas of, as to their identities, but um, the fair certificates of freedom that free people of color uh, had to fill out and put on file with the county has never been found for that family. So we're still hopeful somewhere out in the public that there is a copy, but um, so that's pretty much how we know about the beginnings of Milton Howard, and that's really all that we know at this time. So uh, what happened to the family in that very first year of Milton Howard's life? Well, the family was kidnapped uh, from their home in Muscatine County, Iowa, shortly after Milton Howard was born, and uh, they were taken south and sold to a uh, Alabama planner named Albert James Pickett. Uh, more than likely, they were probably taken from, they were sold in the auction block in St. Louis and taken down south. Now, one thing about it, in the 1850s, uh, the Fugitive Slave Law was passed. And so th what, what that meant was that uh, enslavers, slaveholders, they could go into free states and bring back their enslaved who had run away or they could even kidnap um, people. But uh, they made it a law that free people of color could not really find safety in a free state. And so there was a lot of that going on in the 1850s, especially in Muscatine County because it was right by the river. And um, to Iowa's credit, there were, Whenever it did happen, there were uh, just numerous news stories. You know, it, uh, one one news story I remember is that three African American children were stolen from church, and uh, the, I, far as I know, they've never been found again. That was the one that came to mind. So then the second thing is uh, so. Um, we do have a document called a deed document that we found in Montgomery County probate office that has Milton's name on it. So this deed trust document in this deed trust document, Milton was mortgaged for the benefit of Sarah Smith Harris Pickett, who, who was the wife of Albert James Pickett. And the reason for this is in case Pickett died, then she would have property that she could sell that would get her out of a uh, financial uh, situ situations. So Milton was on this document along with 15 or 16 other children and three or four other adults. Um, 
and it's dated May 2nd, 1853. And uh, I, I've tried to research the people on the document, the, the enslaved on the document, without too much success. Uh, past 1880, I can't seem to find them. And the only thing I really know about them is that they, those, that particular picket was the slaveholder for Wilson Pickett family, the famous soul singer. Um, yeah. I know that much about them, right? So, but uh, to go any further, you really need to uh, research the whole family. And, and so, can you tell us? Go ahead. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, ship's manifest you found and okay, how that relates? Um, through an online forum, uh, one of the administrators found a ship manifest that was dated February 14th, 1852. And on this uh, ship manifest, which Katie has a picture of, uh, the owner shipper, his name was T.S. Bates or Thomas Snell Bates. Bates was born in Rhode Island. And uh, there were six people on it, six enslaved, Sarah, age 23, uh, Mary, age 12, Nathan, age 35, Edwin, age 8, and James, age 6, and Milton, who they just say is a child. Um, Sarah and Nathan are classified as yellow, and the three children, or the four children, are classified as dark. So, it's the right age and the right date to be Milton Howard and his family. There, there are, of course, there's some problems with this because Sarah is 23 and there's a 12 year old on there. So it's unlikely that that is really her biological daughter, but it could be her stepdaughter. And so maybe three of the children really belong to Nathan and then only uh, Milton is Sarah's and Nathan's. But we're still studying that document to, and we're trying to find other documents that will corroborate uh, this document too, so that we know that this is in, indeed our Milton. And what else do you know about Milton's time with the pickets? Well, according to my father uh, in the uh, Target, which is a public Rock Island Arsenal publication that was dated February 4th, 1977, uh, Milton and his family were house slaves for the pickets and that Milton uh, learned to speak French down in Montgomery and that uh, the, because the Pickets spoke French because their family were former Huguenot, French Huguenots. And so the whole, the entire Milton was with his family and they all worked in the house during that time. And how long was he with the, with the plantation and what happened to him? What happened to him we, next? Okay, well, he was with the Pickets until, well, uh, Albert James Pickett died in October of uh, 1858. So um, he died without a will, and so his estate went into probate. And uh, the status, Milton's status, he was not really, after that, after Albert James Pickett uh, mortgaged him for the benefit of his wife, then he became the property of his wife. So Milton is not found in Albert's documents. And so he was not part of the probate. He was uh, the property of Sarah Smith Harris. So that's why we're having trouble finding documents. Um, and then when Pick after, uh, she had to sell him to make money because she had 11 children and he didn't have a will. And so she had to sell, she sold Milton away from his family, who he never saw again, to an uh, Arkansas planner named Howard. And we are, I am uh, researching which Howard that could be. We have somebody in mind. Um, who we have in mind is, I don't mind saying it, although I could be, we could be wrong, uh, Joshua Lloyd Howard, who lived in Lafayette County, Arkansas. Um, he had 33 slaves, and he is the only, uh, enslaver in Arkansas named Howard, who had enough slaves and somebody the age of Milton. So it was it was kind of a good fit for uh, for the, for Milton on that one. And so that's that's where I think and then plus two, 
uh, how this Joshua Lori Howard had a family who was from Howard family who was from a counties near Montgomery County, right? And actually adjacent to adjacent to Montgomery County. Oh, so that's an exciting find. Right. So you said it was 1858 when he was sold. So now, the Civil not, it War. was about it, it was it has to be after eight because Pickett died in 1858. So the so it probably was 59 or 60. Yeah. Uh -huh. And probably close close to 60 because as I said, it's gonna take six months or a year for the probate to process. To go through, right. Yeah. So that was very close to the beginning of the Civil War. Do you know yes, what it became was. became of the uh enslaved people uh, at the Howard Plantation? Well, according to Milton in his Civil War uh, pension record, he said a crowd of them ran at the, uh, the Civil War, his exact words were, when the Civil War broke out, a crowd of them ran off. Uh -huh. So the Civil War began April in 1861. So right around that time, a group of them ran off from the Howard Plantation. Now, that Howard that we think is Milton enslaver had 33 slaves, and he was the the rest of the enslavers named Howard in Alabama, in Arkansas had one or two slaves or less than 10 or eight, and none Milton's age. So yeah, so um, and then and also in that pension service record, he said he lived in Helena Phillips, Arkansas, in 61 and 62. So we think that. When they ran off, they ran behind Union lines to a contraband camp that was that was at Helena Phillips, Arkansas. That's well documented as being there. And that and what's they, a contraband uh, camp? A contraband camp is um, when uh, slaves hid behind Union lines like that. Uh, they were considered contraband, or they no longer were property of their enslavers, but they were property of the Union Army. And they went to some went to school there, some married there, some worked there, some were servants to the Union uh, soldiers. They had uh, the Freedmen's Bureau records documents all the contraband camps. Oh, uh, Milton would have only been about uh, ten when that happened. Uh, so okay. he may have. So the only record he possibly could have had would have been would have been a. Um, a, uh, he went to school there, but I haven't found that record yet. And then also uh, in his pension service record that uh, they wanted to know how he escaped or, or yeah, they, they wanted to record it. They wanted to have a record of it and, or not a record of how he escaped, but um, how he got back from Arkansas to Iowa. And Milton said, and they said not Milton, but they said that a union that a union soldier brought him back to actually back to Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Iowa area, Prairie du Chien McGregor, uh, McGregor area. And he enlisted in McGregor, is that right? He did. He enlisted the 21st of January, 1864, at McGregor, Clayton, Iowa. And can you tell us a little more about his war service? Um, he was in Company F, uh, the 60th U.S. Colored Infantry. Um, he fought at the Battle of Wallace's Ferry, Big Creek, Arkansas. He actually he went back down there toward Helena for a second time in what, but this time he was in the service and he was wounded in battle. He got run over by a, a cannon, a cannon carriage. Uh, he had he got stabbed in the side and he had three or four wounds. Uh, he was in the hospital there and he was all, I think he was also got medical attention in um, uh, Augusta, Richmond, Georgia. He went hmm. that far. And then on October 15th, oh, I might add this that when he enlisted, it is said, I don't have documentation of this, but someone said it's at the uh, Iowa State Archives in Des Moines that he was he enlisted at about age at underage as a drummer boy. He didn't stay a drummer boy. He fought in battle, but he that was his original assignment. 
And then I mean, he uh, was discharged the 15th of October, 1865 at, at Duval's Bluff, Arkansas. Arkansas. So he, sp he spent most of his time in Arkansas. Right. So the Civil War pension files have a lot of information, don't they? And they're they are kept where? How did you? They're kept in the archives. You... Uh, the 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 um, it's called NARA, National Archives and Record Administration, in Washington D.C. And you can go and look at them if you want to. Yeah. yeah. And I I maybe not now because of staff shortage, but I know you can order copies from from NARA. So what else, what other kind of information did you find in that pension file? Well, because he was so young, uh, you, I don't think that you don't find a lot of plantation information as you would in some of them. Some of, some of the pension files have a lot of information about plantations. His pension, he has one or two lines in there uh, about his life at a plantation, nothing about his family, his biological family. Uh, he has a lot of medical information there. He has uh, where he was state, you know, where he was, uh, how much he was paid for, whether you know he was on time or absent. Uh, it has a lot of medical information where he was wounded, when he went to the doctors, what they thought of him, uh, and even after he was, because after that he did he applied for a pension because of his wounds and stuff. So. They documented all that, and it's 130 pages. So what about this uh, affidavit that you found in the pension? Oh, that box? was one thing that was surprising. Well, I was glad that I found it, but it was surprising. This affidavit, uh, when Milton died in, 18, in 1928, uh, Lena applied for his pension, and in order to do that, she had to prove that each of his previous wives were, not, were no longer living. So, so Lena, this, Lena was his. Lena wife? Smith was, yeah, she was my, she was our, she was my great grandmother, and she was his fourth wife that we know of. And his first wife, Kate Jones, she had to prove that Kate Jones was no longer living because, you know, I guess if they were, then they would get part of the pension too. So because uh, Kate died between 1870 and 1875 before the county required. Uh, death records and burial records. Uh, the only thing that um, that Lena could could find to prove that Kate was dead was that there was a person that went to her church who was about 15 year old, years old when Kate was living, and they were neighbors of Milton Howard. And her name was Alice, Mary Alice Reese Richardson. And Mary Alice, uh, her family lived a couple doors down from Milton. And uh, she said, she swore, and this was notarized, she swore to it in an affidavit that she saw Kate Jones dead because at that time, the bodies were, the viewing of the bodies were in the homes, not funeral homes. Yeah. Well, for, for African Americans, yeah. And it looks like it also says uh, she, she tended to Fanny Howard, his second wife. Correct? Fanny Dodge, right. She knew. And yeah, then, uh, Fanny Dodge, they were at the AME church because uh, Alice, Mary Alice Reese Richardson was Methodist. And uh, uh, at that time, yeah, Fanny, Fanny was at and, the Methodist um, church. No, actually, at, what happened so, was she was a missionary. Uh, and so she went to Fanny's house and, and saw that she was dead. Yeah. So the pension file can tell you some a lot of good genealogical information, and that was a surprise to your generation that there were there were more than one wife. Yes, because um, speak I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but I've never heard any of my cousin co other cousins talk about it. I did not know that Milton Howard was married uh, three or four times before my my great grandmother Lena Howard Lena Smith. So uh, what were some of the things that Milton Howard did after he was discharged from the Union Army? Well, uh, one of the things that uh, his company did 
they were involved in a voters rights march that occurred on October 31st, 1865. And they participated in that. That was in the over in the village of East Davenport. Uh, and McClellan Heights at that time was called Camp McClellan. And so that's yeah. where the and that was written up. That's in uh, there's several stories written about that event because Alexander Clark, who was from Muscatine, uh, I think because he organized it, he organized it, right? Yeah. And then March 1st, uh, 1866, Milton Howard began a 56 year career at the Rock Island Arsenal. And he started working as a uh, laborer and a shop tender. And later on, uh, when he became uh, a senior citizen uh, custodian. Uh huh. And he also worked at uh, in the city directories. It it um, notes that Milton Howard worked at uh, Renwick's Mill in 1878. And he also worked for Page Dixon and Company in 1880. So he had, so at least a couple of those times, he had a couple of jobs. Uh -huh. And I'll, as a matter of fact, in um, the 1890s, the Arsenal does have employment records that show that Milton Howard worked there. Oh, that survived. Wow. That survived, yeah. Can we see those copies of those too? <laughs> Uh, they, I found them online, probably Ancestry on Ancestry. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, and and what what is depicted here in this in this photograph? Well, Milton Howard is he worked at, at uh, he and three other gentlemen worked fifty six years or worked more than fifty years at the Rock Island Arsenal. So the Arsenal uh, recognized them for that and gave them awards. They gave them gold pins and they gave them uh, a trip to Annapolis, Maryland. And uh -huh. uh, Milton Howard himself, there's a Civil War Memorial in Washington, DC. I've been there myself. I've seen it with my own eyes and took pictures where his name is inscribed on the, on the memorial as being a veteran of the Civil War. And outside of his work at the Rock Island Ars Arsenal, what what else did he do? Oh, he was life? very active. He uh, he was uh, he he was a licensed Baptist minister, and that's uh, recorded in a newspaper article dated 1877. Uh, he and that was in Rock Island. Although he moved. He moved to the Baptist Church over in Davenport and was a member there for many, many years. I, I at least uh, probably close to 30 years, 20 to 30 years, up on 15th Third Bath. Third, it was called Third Missionary. Well, it's called Third Missionary Baptist now. Um, but aside from that, he preached where he was ever was called. He was someone was always asking him to preach somewhere and that there's uh, more than there's hundreds of newspaper articles that uh, talk about his preaching at different churches, even the African Methodist Church he preached at, all of the ba other Baptist churches. Uh, he was a pallbearer or honorary pallbearer for funerals. He preached at funerals. He had other ministers, he and Lena over to the house for dinner. Uh, he was, and that was just his church activities. Um, he was a ward alderman and a ward alderman alternate, at least on two occasions that I know of. Um, if in, he, and he was always being interviewed for his opinion on certain things. There were a couple of murders and people would uh, ask him what was his opinion on this, this person murdering that person. He would be in the newspaper. He was always being written up in the newspaper. And um, so the was, local the one thing, yeah, someone once wrote when he died that um, he was just uh, he always made the best of the opportunities that presented themselves to him. That he always made the best of them. And I might say that he learned French in the South, but when he came up here and there was a lot of immigrants, um, 
he learned German, Italian, English, French, and and possibly Spanish. Yeah. And it's written up in newspaper articles and books. So you you really depended a lot on the local newspaper reports here in Davenport, Rock Island. Right, and the Davenport Public Library because I got all my information that's not this it wasn't digitized or either I could I don't know, but I found I spent hours down in the Davenport Public Library, the birth records, the marriage records, the cemetery records, uh, divorce records, uh, city directories, newspaper articles. Yeah, census records too. <laughs> census, census you can find yeah. online. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, you mentioned the city directories. Do you know whereabouts Milton Howard lived for different periods of his life in Davenport? Yes, he lived uh, down on Front Street, Front and Brady. He lived uh, about 7th and Iowa. He lived at least 20, at about 25 different places, between 20 and 25 different places. And uh, I have, if you go to, I don't know, just email me and I, because I plotted all those places on Google Maps. And it is quite uh, interesting to see all the places that he lived in and where they were. He lived down, he even lived as far as um, down there by Fillmore down. Usually he stayed on the east side, but there was one or two places that he lived over there on the west side. Uh -huh. And for a long, and then he moved uh, at least once a year or every other year up until the 1890s. And then the 1890s, he, uh, they moved over on East 13th Street. And uh, they lived there for, or no, the 1900s. They lived there until about 1920. Mm -hmm. They lived uh, uh, over on East 13th. It's just north of... Um, uh, Sacred Heart. Sacred Heart. Sacred Heart yeah. Cathedral. Yeah. So, it, among among the uh, Irish immigrant community there. <laughs> uh, and then, did he ever own property? He did. So, uh, right around 1920, a, a few years before, he bought a lot that was over at uh, uh, Judson and 15th Street, and on that lot, he built a home. Uh, I haven't found the records for the home yet. I mean, I, I found some, I haven't found the actual construction records, um, but you can go down to the courthouse and and uh, research his lot in his home. So and I be, will say they were moved record. into it. I know the home was built by 1920 because they're at that address in 1920. And then and by 1925, it was paid for because they noticed so on the uh, Iowa State Census that was dated, that was, that they uh, did in 1925, that he owned his own home and it was free from any mortgage. And he built the house himself, is that right? Right, right. Uh, so um, tell us a little bit more about his family life and some of the sources that you used to establish the relationship between family members. Um, well, the first thing is to research him under Smith because he used the name Milton Smith just as much as he used the name Mil Milton Howard or Milton Howard Smith. So to reconstruct the family life, I used, uh, I used early uh, census records and I used his uh, pension, Civil War pension service records, those early. And then, uh, And and Oakdale Cemetery records, uh, they mm -hmm. were very helpful. Uh, so that that told about the early children. Uh huh. And and the wives and the wives also. So we have this photograph. Do you want to talk about some of the people in this photograph? Okay. I'll share it. I'll share it. to the screen. So this is Milton Howard. 
Okay, so left to right, we've got sitting on the ground, the child sitting on the ground is Eugene Murphy Howard. And right behind him is his mother, Lena Smith Howard. And next is Milton Howard or Milton Smith. And then the little girl sitting on the ground is my grandmother, Pearl Cecilia Howard. And, mm -hmm. and back behind her is a member of Lena's family. We're not sure which one she is, uh, but I imagine it's a uh, half sister. These are, ha these are half sisters. Uh, the next tall man in the back, that's Edward Charles Howard. And then the next two ladies, the lady in the chair and the lady behind her, those are Lena's sis uh, half sisters, I believe, also. Uh huh. So you've traced um, the the line from Mil Milton Howard, but also from Lena Smith. Right there, uh, the Smiths are very active. They're they've all taken uh, they are, they've all taken those autosomal DNA tests on ancestry, scores of them. And they all have family trees, and actually, uh, a couple of those, uh, maybe not the sisters, but their kids, uh, t three of them were librarians. Two, yeah, uh -huh. I think at least three of them were librarians, and one of them was in like um, out in um, Idaho or Bozeman. But anyway, they they built a monument to one of the librarians. They built a monument at her library because she did so much for the library. <laughs> Well, illustrious uh, yeah. <laughs> ancestors there. So, um, so you also had a relative from that line in who served in the First World War. That was Uncle Bill. Yeah, Uncle Bill. Um, he was born in 1894, and when he and during first, the first world war he joined and he I, I think he served over there in france and they uh, there was a newspaper article written up about him that they spent i want several days in uh foxholes and that he had spent at least one day in there by himself and that he they actually uh notified lena that he was presumed dead and he actually wasn't <laughs> and that was written up in the newspaper. Yeah. Uh -huh. he actually, he lived to be, he lived until 1974. Yeah. Oh, wow. So the tradition of uh, military service continued. Right. All of them, if they didn't serve, they uh, signed up. Mm -hmm. Every, all of his sons signed up. Mm -hmm. Not the girls, but. Uh, the, all the sons signed up, and Uncle Roy served, Uncle Bill served, uh, Warren signed up, Eugene signed up. They all they signed up, yeah. So, uh, and then what can you tell us about Milton Howard's final days and his death? Milton Howard died uh, March eighteenth. 1928 uh, at church, he had a heart attack. He had been suffering from heart problems for uh, several years. And when he was at church, he they said he fainted and had a heart attack. The name of the church was Faith Apostolic Church and it was located at 8th and Harrison. Hmm. So, and he's so buried he in the soldier's lot at Oakdale Cemetery. uh-huh and there were uh all there were of course there were all kind of newspaper articles written yeah he was very already very well well known right so before you started to do some serious research into your family history what did you know about milton howard from your family members uh, well, my dad was, I, I remember this so well, he would always say, you come from good stock. And of course, I didn't know what exactly he meant. Well, yeah, I know more now since I uh, researched Milton Howard, but that's who he was talking about was Milton Howard. And uh -huh. uh, that always stuck with me. And then um, 
of course, a story that he when he married that he that when he married a uh, grandma Lena, he already had a child older than Lena. Of course, we never knew where this child came from, you know. <laughs> but he just <laughs> always said that he did, yeah. So that was another thing that uh, he passed down. And then also that um, my great my grandmother told me that uh, she would one day she asked him. One day he asked her to bring him the newspaper and she went and got it and gave it to him. And then when she came back, he was reading the newspaper, but it was upside down. So that was when she knew either he couldn't read and write, he couldn't read, or he was a senior and was just doing it that way, that we're not sure what happened there. <laughs> we, we, we know he had, he had to have some level of education to be uh, fluent in several languages and he could write his name and uh, I we're just, he probably had an elementary school education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, one other, one of my, another story that was passed down and we all laughed about this is that uh, my uncle, uh, Ulysses Howard, we call him Uncle Howard he would be misbehave and a uh, Milton Howard would chase him around the house with his cane. And he would, uh, Uncle, Uncle Howard would hide under the bed and then Milton Howard used his cane to go in there and get him out. <laughs> <laughs> so and we, uh, what I was... remember I was alive when Uncle Bill was living. I was alive when Uncle Roy was living. Uh, I did not know Eugene who died about I was alive, but I was only like three years old. And then of course, Warren and Charles died many years previous to that. So you are descended from Pearl. Pearl, Pearl Cecilia. Pearl, right. He only Mr. had Graham. two girls that we know oh. of. He had a daughter named Irene in 1901 that passed away from, I believe, pneumonia. And then uh, Pearl was born in 1896. So, um, what what was it that actually prompted you to begin documenting Milton Howard's and his descendants' lives? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because that's one of the most interesting parts of all this. One of my younger cousins uh, remembered that my father had done some genealogy and that he used an old computer and that he had put together a, fr a family trivia quiz um, you know, that they would play from time to time. But uh, in in 87, my father passed away. I was at college. My I was getting my master's degree at Northern and my father passed away. And she just felt that if we could pick up where my father, because after my father died, no one ever did anything genealogy wise. If we could just pick up from where he left off, we would be able to help our children and uh, younger people in our family understand uh, the value of work ethic, um, how Milton Howard, how he persevered when things were just so impossible, how he persevered through the deaths of several, you know, half a dozen children, how he persevered mm -hmm. in a time when there were lynchings and, you know, just un unfavorable treatment toward African Americans. And I, I myself, uh, I thought that would be a good idea. I had, uh, I had some losses of my own. My own husband passed away and I, I just kind of picked up with it. And then one thing led to another. I took a DNA test and I got I, uh, kind of corroborated with the, my mother's side of the family and they told me the ropes and showed me how to get started at it. Great, so that was what, maybe 15, 20 years after your father had done his research? But that was the way it was. I think it was longer than that because I I think I took it. I started in 2013. I went to family uh -huh. reunions. We did some. Um, we weren't researching every day, but in 2013, I can say I started researching every day. Uh -huh. And look how far you've come. So yeah. what are some Thank what are, what are some of your most recent finds and uh, what? What are some of the next steps on your journey here? Um, well, we found that deed in 2018, I believe, 2018, 2019. Then I found the ship manifest 
or it was found for me in uh, probably 2019, 2020. Um, we've, we, I, I found a lot on, uh, I didn't know anything about Milton's wife named Hattie Washington. And I was able to trace her family completely, which is a, another story. And um, uh, we've been, we were able to replace some uh, grave markers at Oakdale for his children and his grandchildren. We did that this year in 2021. Um, we are, uh, we have a good lead on his Howard enslaver. I'm happy to say, I don't know what's taken me so long to try to break through that, but we have some good leads on that. And that's gonna be, that's gonna give us um, really jumpstart our research once we figure that out. And you have some uh, artifacts as well as documents, correct? Oh, I inherited from my father's side of the family uh, a, it was a silver chest, a mahogany silver chest that was dated when I took it to have it uh, redone, uh, 189, about 1895. And uh, so that was great. It was, a they had made it an end table. And I remember this end table it was painted green. It had, well, first that I had black lacquer on it and then it had green paint over that. And we, it has brass hinges on it. So. That was quite a find. And then my friend, Ann Banks, who I haven't talked about much down here. Ann Banks is a descendant of Milton Howard's first enslaver, Albert James Pickett. And we actually, she and I actually found that document together when we went down to Montgomery for a weekend. We did some research down there. So she had, she inherited um, some papers and silver, some silverware from her side of the family that belonged to Sarah Smith Harris Pickett. And she gave me one serving spoon to go into the redone, the refinished um, silver chest. So we're quite excited and happy about that. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So do you have any plans to publish your research or present on your research in the future? Well, I would like to uh, write a book, write a genealogy of Milton Howard, uh, so that people will know who his children are and his wives were and his grandchildren uh, with a bibliography and index and sources. I think that would help a lot because then people will know exactly who his family was because we didn't when we started. And uh, our younger people and our children need to know, you know, who their cousins are. Um, and then, uh, I, and yes, I would like to publish it one day. <laughs> uh, um, we do have, Ann and I both have been invited back down to Montgomery by the uh, Alabama Archives and History to put on a presentation for them in February of 2022 that we both said yes to. Uh, we've got another iron in the fire. Uh, and what, I, it was either, um, it's one of the it's one of the news stations that somebody contacted us about that we're supposed to be giving a presentation about together. So yeah, uh, yeah that's we'd love to see you too. Well, um, there was somebody from ABC. ABC, ABC, right? Yeah. So we'll see. I mean, a lot of people get in touch, and then that's the last you hear of them, but. And what was the, uh, it was the Smithsonian and the, uh, what, Anne. Uh, oh, you, what, what are you asking, Karen? The Smith, you wrote another article, the Smithsonian, oh, it was uh, in another. The article is, uh, was for um, uh, USA Today. US, okay. And it's a short article and they're on my website if you want to share the the uh, URL of the website. I wrote sure, something. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I wrote something after the uh, January 6th um, insurrection in Washington having to do with these mm -hmm. issues. Okay. Anne has a, has a uh, website called Confederates in My Closet in which she right. uh, blogs about that. I, I, tried to write about some of these ancestors 
uh, as a way of kind of undermining lost cause ideology, which is kind of still present in our culture. So right. that's what that's about. So uh, in the chat, I put the name of the website, or it's a blog, right? Yes, yeah, so it's a website, a blog, either one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And everything is on well, there. Karen and I did a webinar. We've did, done several webinars, actually, and there are links to those. We did one through the Shelter Island Public Library. Um, and so there are links to everything there, basically. Well, thank you so much, Anne, for pitching in here at the end. Um, and Karen, I can't thank you enough for sharing your information about your ancestry and particularly Milton Howard uh, with your local Davenport Public Library. <laughs> and so we'd like to invite everyone to uh, turn on their cameras and microphones again. And uh, we have a few more minutes. You can ask uh, Karen any questions that you might have. I was just going to make a comment. <clears throat> it's Pamela. Anne, you look like you're in a warm place. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in sweatshirts. <laughs> I'm warm because I'm inside. <laughs> oh, is that the only reason? OK. <laughs> uh, I might say that Pamela uh, is a volunteer at the Iowa State Archives in Iowa City, and already uh, she's told me, and this pertains to Sybil too, that she has found a Milton Howard relative in Kentucky, you said? It's uh, Louisville, Kentucky, yes. Yeah, that she's yeah. going to tell us about later. So we're excited about that too. I don't know if it's the right moment to say this, but Karen, I'm really interested in this voting rights march that uh, Milton participated in. Um, is there information about that on your website? I'll or uh, I'll try to send it to you. I'll try to find it online. There's been at least, there's several articles written about it and I will try, I will make it a point to uh, send that to you, email those articles or at least send you the links. And the picture of of the memorial with his name on it in Washington. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Deb, did Karen, you have can a question? I say something about the voting right the voting rights march? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it was um, also in conjunction with the colored convention projects. They also, besides the march, signed a big petition in Senate to the legislature asking for uh, African-American males to be able to vote. And that was sent in. And it was signed by almost the entire 60th USCT regiment. Uh, that's really fascinating. I'm putting my email in the chat. Is it possible for you to send me a link about that? Sure, sure. I'd love to write about that on my website. And if anyone else is willing to share their email address, I can put together a list of some of the sources that uh, we've discussed today with Karen. And uh, you know that, that might be helpful if anyone else is doing research on African-American genealogy or Civil War history or just local history. I mean, there's so much going on now about, you know, voting rights. And I've just been watching, there's a show on the 14th Amendment that I think was on Netflix or HBO or something like that, um, that Will Smith was kind of the presenter of. So it's really in the news now, this whole issue of voting rights and um, how long the struggle for these rights has been going on. Anything else? 
I just want to just say that the one of the main things to remember about Milton Howard that I did not know when I started researching is that he was a child when a lot of these events happened. And so for researchers, you're really researching a child. You're not researching an adult. And that's, it's altogether different because they really did not keep records for children back then. And they barely kept records for women, but, uh, and it's usually just the men that the, the records are in. And so, but don't be discouraged by that, you know, um, because he always lied about his age. He always <laughs> lied about his age. So <laughs> there are records for him, but he's not the age that he said he was, right? <laughs> I did have a question for Karen. Is the house still on Judson still standing? No, it is not. I'm sorry to say that it, it was, uh, it fell into disrespect, disrepair. My grandmother died in 1980 and my father died in 87. And uh, for whatever reason, no one in the family took the initiative to or cared about it. They all had, you know, uh, a lot of us were out of town. Um, uh, and I'm, there's a, we have a one side of the family. We have uh, one of Milton Howard's grandchildren still living uh, that lives out in California. She's born about 1930. Uh, that we were never knew anything about and she has 50 children and great grandchildren and we're just now finding oh. out about that so, <laughs> oh my goodness yeah. wow <laughs> i know koki and i were drive, doing a road tour one day to see if it was still standing and, and we didn't think that we found it but i just wanted to verify yeah uh, i would like if i you know i think someone should you know maybe uh, start a go fund me so we we can rebuild it or a replica <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I mean, do you guys still own the property? Uh, we do not own the property, uh, but it is in the extended family. Oh, okay. All right. Well, actually, my we brother, actually, that's not true. Half of it, the lot was divided into my brother owns half of it. And then the other half is uh, in a family that we married into. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thanks we for can... sharing. <laughs> we welcome. can we can try to track down a copy of the deed for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, great! That would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, uh, I'm very eager. I appreciate to all you attending. Well, thank you for a wonderful presentation and so informative. I uh, was so excited when I saw this subject come up on the uh, Devonport Book Library's calendar of events. And uh, I actually work at our local museum here in Devonport, the Putnam Museum, and we're working on uh, redoing our local history exhibit. And there's such a wealth of information about not only your ancestors, but also the world that they lived in and the events that they're associated with. And I wanna thank you for all the detective work that you've done and research. And I, I put my email in the chat. And if you wanna talk more about the local history exhibit, and you know, we actually are featuring uh, Davenporters of note, quest citizens of note in our history. And I'd love to talk to you about Howard and the research. That's wonderful. Okay, thank you. That's great to hear. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, on behalf of the Richardson Sloan Special Collection Center of the Davenport Public Library. So I will stop the recording. And um, please just, if you have any further questions about um, re local resources, we can always help you here. Um, you can write to special collections at Davenport library.com or directly to me at k reinhardt r-e-i-n-h-a-r-d-t at davenportlibrary.com or give us a call at 563-326-7902 thank you again karen it was great to have you with us too Anne, and for everyone who joined in tonight
Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.